Right, welcome to our fourth session. Somewhat delayed by the storm, but unfortunately, it uh, took out a massive oak tree in the village, which managed to sever the power lines, and I had no power for uh, 29 hours or so, which meant that my normal last minute preparations, I, I like to do these things at the last minute in case something crops up that has changed, um, caught me out. So my apologies. Now, you will hopefully have noticed in the mail that I've sent round, I've included a couple of videos, um, one of which the European Fell Brood, I really do think you should watch. And the other one will be on Varroa, which will give you uh, a more in-depth uh, coverage than I can supply myself. You have to excuse me, I'm a bit choked up this morning with, um, I don't know what, I'm, I've reacted to something, I'm sneezing my head off. Um, and by the way, I don't know the time shows in this thing, but it is currently 20 to 7 in the morning, because I've been up half the night. Okay, so... There are currently two notifiable bee diseases in the UK, and this is something you need to know about. You have a legal obligation to contact the bee inspectorate, whether in Scotland or south of the border, and inform them that you have a suspicion that you are infected. Now, if you're a member of the Scottish Beekeepers Association, as part of your membership, you have disease insurance. So before we look at what's wrong, let's have a look at what's right. This is a Langstroth frame, and it is a nice pattern of seal brood. And as you can see, this is quite a dark biscuit color. And this is equally a nice brood pattern, and it's a lighter biscuit colour. Why? Well, this one's darker because it's an older comb. You can tell by the, the darker uh, tone at the top. And the bees have used some of that darker wax to form the cappings. It's as simple as that. Whereas this one, you can see here, it's much fresher looking comb and therefore you get these lighter cappings. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, the cappings are porous, by the way, so that the bees, uh, the, the larvae that are pupating underneath can uh, get oxygen. So, absolutely healthy, absolutely healthy. Now then, the two notifiable disease, diseases are American fowl brood, AFB, and European fowl brood. The names refer to where they were discovered, not to where they are located, okay? In actual fact, the biggest problem in the UK is European fowl brood. Um, American fowl brood crops up uh, now and again, and it is incredibly persistent. There was a map at Krebston of the northeast of Scotland. And there was pins on the map. And those pins had been sat there for God knows how many decades because every now and again, American fowl brood would reappear in the same place, right? Perthshire is well known for it. There was a couple of locations there. There's a location in Aberdeenshire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you have American fowl brood, the bees and the combs will have to be destroyed under the supervision of the bee inspector. The larvae that causes it, and I'll probably get this wrong in my pronunciation because they changed the name as they've got a nasty habit of doing Phenobacillus, I think that is how it's pronounced. It's highly contagious, long lasting. European fowl brood is not so severe, can be treated with drugs, and the active agent is Melissococcus plutonius. 
Now, before we go any further, just to put things a little bit in perspective, in keeping bees over 30 years, I have never been anywhere near an outbreak of the above two, but that means nothing as it could happen tomorrow. Every inspection that you conduct, every inspection, you will need to keep an eye out for disease. And that means oddly placed or colored larvae and or cappings. If you have any doubts whatsoever, don't contact Jimmy next door because he probably ain't got a clue. Or Jenny for that matter. Contact the bee inspector. They have kits that they travel with. <clears throat> they can take a sample from the, in the, the dubious colony and they can tell you on the spot whether there is a problem or not. And then you will have to follow their advice. If you don't, trust me, there is a high jump in place waiting for somebody to take it. Fair warning. So, um, American fellow brood looks like this. And the point of this, this is a hive tool. Um, the classic way of doing this test is actually a matchstick, but not many people carry matchsticks these days, much boxes. The classic definitive test of AFB is you dip into an infected cell. You pull the, the um, matchstick or twig back out and you have this ropiness, it's called, which could stretch to about an inch, 25 mil. And that is the definitive, you've got AFB test. There's also a very nasty smell. You get these sunken cappings. You get perforated cappings. Um, it just looks off, really off. Now, some years ago, I did um, a very rough test on the amounts of notifiable disease outbreaks the amount of beekeepers and divided one by the other. And I came out with something like one in 800. So the odds are extremely good that like me, you'll never come into contact with it. But on the other hand, you have to know it exists and you have to know what it looks like. So the other classic description of American Thal Brood is the pepper pot. And it looks as if instead of this lovely solid slab of brood that you would expect to see where the queen has systematically been laying and the bees have systematically fed and systematically capped over. Instead, you get this mess and it's pepper potty because these larvae have died before the bees um, uh, went to cap them and other cappings have uh, been partially removed by the bees uh, because they know something's wrong and they're trying to do their best to rectify it. Now, the problem with American fowl brood is it is incredibly contagious. And one of the vectors, which I think will come up a little bit further along, but um, there is a bee behavior called robbing, where the bees are opportunists um, and they're not frightened to be opportunistic. Uh, where there is the chance of getting a free lunch, they will grab it with all, all six legs. And if a colony is weakened, uh, the guard bees aren't uh, paying attention or unable to pay attention, the robbers will systematically strip the colony of honey. And part of the problem is that um, AFB spores can live in honey quite happily. And that's how the thing spreads. And it's also why 
as a matter of routine, you do not want to feed honey that has not come from somewhere that you are absolutely 100% of. In other words, foreign honey, be very wary about even thinking about allowing bees access to it. One of the classic locations for American fall brood is adjacent to premises that pack honey from abroad. Need I say more? So, um, your bees and your combs will be destroyed under the supervision, as I said, of the bee inspector, excuse me. <coughs> and uh, depending on how severe the, inf the, the infestation is, then the um, actual hives themselves may have to be burnt as well. Um, to be honest, if I had American fall brood, I would want rid of the actual hives. I wouldn't want to take the chance. It's it's just far too dangerous. But that's my personal viewpoint on it. So, um, very, very nasty situation. But probably you are relatively unlikely to come across it. The European fowl brood, though, is a different ballgame. Now, before we look at EFB, let's just have a look at lovely shot of um, fresh comb. And you can see the larvae, how they're sitting in a pool of royal jelly and they look ever so comfortable. They're lying flat. Yeah, these ones are a little bit older. Probably that's two days older possibly than that one. But the point is they are normal. That is what you expect to see when you look at um, a frame of open brood. So, neurobean fall brood. Caused by, as we've mentioned, Melissa Caucus Pluton, EFB affects larvae and can cause a significant reduction in the capacity of the hive and if unchecked can lead to the entire colony dying. The larvae first become infected when they take in food which has been contaminated by the Melissococcus plutum bacterium. And you've got to wonder where that comes from in the first place. Quite possibly from robbing and also by moving colonies, which um, are then at a higher risk of being exposed to an infection in another area. The point is with this, you can have it at quite a low level um, and an inexperienced beekeeper could be quite um, confident they, they don't have a problem, although they do. And one of their colonies gets a little bit weak, robbing bees take advantage. You're packing up your apiary to move it off to the heather or wherever. And of course you take a little bonus with you that you don't want. So, Infection caused by robbing. A colony with EFB is susceptible to robbing because it will be weakened, <clears throat> increasing the chances that the infection will be spread to other hives. Beekeeping equipment that has been contaminated with EFB and not properly cleaned, transferring combs from infected hives, for instance, to a previously uninfected hive. Now bear in mind, at a low level, this could be done absolutely innocently. Once the bacterium is inside the larvae, it grows within their gut, consuming most of the food they take in. So the bacterium is competing with the larvae for the food. This normally results in starvation and the death of the larvae. If the larvae survives the disease and pupates, it will then lead more of the bacteria through its feces, which can spread the infection further within the hive because worker bees are going into that cell and they are cleaning and obviously becoming contaminated with the spores and then transferring them to the next cell they start to clean. Instead of the larvae dies, it dries to a dark scale, which also causes the infection to spread. Again, the cleaning behavior. Hives are considerably more susceptible when under stress from moving, from bad weather, from poor nutrition. Well, bad weather and poor nutrition go hand in hand, can't fly, can't feed, simple. 
An infection can remain in the hive even with no visible signs, only to break out again if the hive comes under stress from external factors. Migratory beekeeping, classic. That's not to say there's anything wrong with migratory beekeeping. I've done it for many, many years, but it does add stress to the colonies. So, because worker bees often remove disease larvae, European fallow brood can be hard to detect. Most larvae will die before capping, but some will die after, which can lead to misdiagnosis of American fallow brood. There can actually also be a slight ropiness from European fallow brood, like American fallow brood, but in not quite the same stretch. Three quarters of an inch instead of an inch. But, you know, that's... Um, it's a, it's a hard one to call. So beekeepers should look out for the following signs of infection in their hives. Diseased larvae change color from white to a yellowish brown. The dead larvae may be watery in consistency. There may be a sour odor present and American fowl brood is a really nasty smell apparently. The brood pattern will become uneven with capped and uncapped cells mixed together, warming sign. Says EFB is most likely to occur in spring or autumn, beekeepers should examine their hives for EFB a minimum of two times a year during those seasons. Remove each frame, remove the bees, and carefully inspect it for any of the symptoms listed above. Hmm. Remove the bees from the frame completely. Uh -huh. Bit of a challenge, huh? Prevention. <clears throat> now, I really like this first line. The best way to protect your hives is to stop them getting infected in the first place. How? While it's almost impossible to fully protect a hive, well, really, these steps should significantly reduce the risk. Maintain the highest possible of levels of hive hygiene by keeping all beekeeping equipment clean. Try not to introduce unknown bees or equipment to the hives to reduce the risk of infection spreading. <laughs> the hive with a young queen regularly. <laughs> I think they mean re-queened regularly. A younger, healthier queen will be better for the hive. But these from bees already proven to be resistant from disease if possible. Now there's a big one. Take every precaution when moving bees to minimize stress. Stress is a key factor for EFB. Take every precaution to minimize stress when moving bees. That is almost meaningless, to be honest. I mean, when you move bees, you've got to shut them in. You've got to lift them. You've got to handle them. You know, manhandle the actual unit. Then you have to drive them. Then you have to unload them, let them out. Uh, how you can minimize the stress in that situation, I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> Ensure bees have access to good supplies of pollen and nectar and use artificial feeding methods when necessary as this too will help keep stress at a minimum. And again, that's all very fine and well, but if you're in the middle of the active season and you've got super on, you don't want to be artificially feeding syrup. You're liable to contaminate what honey you've got. Some of the advice you really have got to wonder. It's written by theorists, I think. So, treatment and control. Some countries, um, you can buy chemicals to treat yourself, but not in the UK, you can only treat under the direction of a bee inspector. EFB can be treated with antibiotics, however, extensive antibiotic use could possibly lead to the proliferation of antibiotic resistant restraints of the bacteria. For this reason, the destruction of the affected colonies is a better way of curbing the spread of the disease. Probably true. If you have multiple colonies and more than 10% of them show signs of the disease, every colony should be treated. Now, there was a big outbreak of EFB um, a few years back 
there were shrieking headlines in the red press of um, the Queen's beekeeper is uh, dosing his bees illegally, blah, blah, blah. Actually, um, I know the man involved, and he knew he had EFB, very, very experienced beekeeper. He started treating as he shouted for the bee inspector, because he knew by the time they got their act into gear, he was going to be in a pretty precarious position because of the number of hives he had. And he knew that the inspectorate would struggle to cope with just the sheer numbers. Um, he got taken to court for treating without permission, pled guilty to get it over and done with. Um, but he said effectively by pleading guilty, paying the fine, he was paying to save his heather crop which was his main um, target. So he made a, a, if you like, a calculated business decision. Uh, for the likes of us, people with um, who are not relying for our livelihood on the situation, then um, it's a case of hands off, stand back and do what the inspector says. Now, Having dealt with the European fall broods and the American fall brood, very quick overview. As I say, I will put out video links and I strongly suggest you spend a bit of time watching them. Um, the Zima used to be considered a fairly major problem. Um, it still exists. You've probably, if you have bees, you probably have it at a very um, low level. Uh, there's two variations in um, the country, Nazima apis, which is the normal one, and the Asian one, Nazima serrani. Both are highly specialized parasitic microsporidian fungal pathogens. Nazima SPP, they invade the digestive cells binding the midgut of the bee. There they multiply rapidly, and within a few days, the cells are packed with spores. This is the resting stage of the parasite. When the host cell ruptures, it sheds spores into the gut where they accumulate in masses to be later excreted by the bees. If spores from the excretia are picked up and swallowed by another bee, they can germinate and once more become active, infecting, obviously, starting another round of infection and multiplication. The bottom line here is avoid crushing bees as much as you possibly can because when the bees are infected and they are packed with spores, crushing a bee obviously just releases it. You're, uh, you're just compounding the problem. One of the symptoms of Nozema in the hive is you will find dysentery. If at all possible, bees will not defecate inside the colony for obvious reasons. They do it on the wing outside. And I'll tell you this, when I was at Cravston and we had 60 colonies overwintering on site, the following year, it was extremely noticeable that the grass in the apiary grew a damn sight faster than the rest of the grass on the estate. So you can guess what was powering that growth. So, um, diagnose... To get a diagnosis of Nozema, you need a fairly high powered microscope, about 400. And the classic description is rice grains. And that's these guys here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And the way that they used to calculate the level of infection was they would use um, a slide that had a, a, a grid drawn across it, like, like a wire mesh grid. And they could say that, well, okay, we've got um, 10 inside that square and 15 inside that square, and then do a calculation and say, you know, it's, it's a mild infestation or it's a severe infestation or it's in between. And a lot of people, um, used to enjoy doing the diagnosis with the, with the microscopes. Uh, 
Acarine is now less prevalent, possibly due to Varroa treatments. We'll come on to Varroa shortly. Um, the Acarine mite is also not considered to be the problem it was thought to be in the past. And the Acarine mite, Acarapis woodi. Um, bit of a story here. Bees started dying in fairly massive numbers in the late um, Second World, uh, First World War years going on into the, the 1920s. And Brother Adam called it the Isle of Wight disease and maintained that from his base in Darkest Devon, that uh, all the native bees in the United Kingdom had died. Now, given that at the time, and I'm not knocking Brother Adam, I'm just trying to be a bit realistic about this. He was a novice monk. He was um, basically confined to the monastery um, by virtue of his status. How he could know what was happening in Yorkshire, let alone Aberdeenshire or Caithness. Um, I just can't get my head around it. Anyway, he, he came out with these rather sweeping statements. So why is the thing called Acarapus woodi? Well, Acarapus obviously is fairly reasonable. Acarine Acarapus, we can get that link. But woodi, well, woodi was a person, a Mr. Wood. And he lived in Bankery on Royal D side. And he had retired from uh, working in India, I believe it was. And Bankery was considered to be um, a very nice place to retire to and had quite a, a density of ex-colonial workers who lived there after their uh, service abroad. And he was a beekeeper and he was upset about the Isle of Wight disease, so-called. And I actually knew a lovely gentleman, Alistair Lilburn, who knew personally Mr. Wood. So now that I'm getting on a bit, I suppose somebody down the line will say, well, I knew Pete Watt, who knew Alistair Lilburn, <laughs> who knew Mr. Wood. But it's nice in a way that there's a... A direct link. So, Mr. Wood went to the um, B unit at Cranston and said to them, I'd like to sponsor some research into this and gave them £6,000, which was a very substantial amount of money in them days. I mean, you're talking the purchase price of a pretty big house. I mean, a big house. Anyway, they set sail at the um, Crips and Units and they discovered these mites living in the trachea. And that's how Acarine was found. Um, I'll just mention chalk brood. You will see little white cells. Uh, which are the mummies from chalk brood. The, the larvae actually um, turns almost like stone. And it's one of the things with open mesh floors, if you've got um, chalk brood and you're moving the bees, you know, physically migrating the bees, when you pick up the hive and you tilt it slightly, you'll, you'll actually hear the mummies running, rattling across the mesh. And uh, sack brood is another one. It's a requeen job. Chalk brood is a requeen job. They're not major problems. Um, you do get some colonies that can get very chalky, um, if you like. A lot of the, the, the brood is infected. Um, and that's very definitely a requeen situation. And apart from anything else, I hate to say it, but that slide's actually out of order, but not to worry. So going back to Nazima, 
there are no medicines in the country, this country, that are um, legalized for Nazima. So try and maintain your colonies in good health by applying good husbandry practices, such as maintaining strong, well-fed and disease-tolerant colonies head of our young and prolific queens. Beekeepers should also consider recreating susceptible colonies with queens from more tolerant stocks of bees, which are better able to cope with Nazima infection. Is that helpful? Not really. Again, that's been written by a theorist. So symptoms of Nazima outwards, very little. Um, dysentery is sometimes seen, but not always. Uh, Nazima more or less exists as a kind of a background problem. It's only when it gets really bad that you will actually see the um, dysentery in the colony. The dysentery is not caused by the pathogen, but as a consequence of infection that can be exacerbated during periods of prolonged confinement during inclement weather, especially during the spring. This can lead to the bees being forced to defecate in the hive, therefore contaminating it further. Stands the reason, for, basically. Uh, where are we? That's one more on. Okay, so moving on. This is the big one. And uh, it's one of the videos that I will be sending the link for. Now, take this on board. Unless you keep bees in the outer islands or the far northwest of Scotland, you need to learn to live with Varroa. You will have it. Like it or lump it, you will have it. It arrived in April 1992, was found in Devon and was very well established. And within a matter of, I think it was about a fortnight, the uh, bee inspectors threw up our hands and said, well, we can't contain this. It's, you know, it's endemic. I can't remember exactly when it arrived in Scotland, but it was about two or three years later. That's how fast it moved. And mainly the vector is us beekeepers moving hives. So what is Varroa? And by the way, the technical name for Varroa <laughs> is Varroa destructor. Varroa destructor. That tells you just how nasty this thing is. Right. Varroa has a really almost a bizarre incestuous life cycle. Um, it actually crossed from the Asian bee, Avis serrana, and it lives with Avis serrana quite happily, but then it crossed over onto the European honeybee, and our honeybees have yet to uh, adapt to it. And if you don't keep an eye on it, a really good eye on it, it will kill your colony. So the mites enter the cell, the lar the, the, this is the larvae cell, uh, with a larvae about five to five and a half days old. So our workers are three, five, aren't they? Three days an egg five days of larvae, so mature larvae, just about to get capped, and the mite goes, nips inside. And these things are quick. You wouldn't believe how quick they are, and they can jump. And when I say jump, they can jump nine, 10 inches in the air. Yeah, they really are nippy. So, the mite moves down the larvae to the bed of royal jelly. Um, then it gets on to the larva and it starts to consume the hemolymph, the blood. And the female lays her first egg about 60 hours after the cells capped and subsequent eggs at 30 hours 
awful lot. Now bear in mind, she's got eight days to play with. Three an egg, five a larvae, eight days capped. So, sorry, that's not right. I'm thinking about a queen, I do beg your pardon. 21 minus eight is 14, 13, 13 days to play with. The, the eggs develop to larvas, to protonymph, to deuteronymph, and the developing mites feed on the bee, damaging and thus leaving the bee exposed to pathogens. The first egg that the varroa female, the adult female lays, turns into a male. And that male will mate with the other eggs that the, uh, the mite has laid, which are female. Why they don't implode from inbreeding, nobody seems to understand, but they don't. And that's how it works. Mating begins within the cell. Adult females leave the cell with the emerging bee. Male and immature stages of mites stay in the cell. Well, apparently, for every mite that goes into a cell, at least two come out. And if it's drone brood, because of the extra three days, you can get one or two more. So mites prefer drone brood by a factor of eight to one. And then mites transfer via close contact with the bees, and you'll even get adult mites, which is what that lump there is, uh, riding on the bees and continuing to suck the hemolymph. So apart from the damage that is done to the pupating um, larva, and if you have a really heavy infestation of varroa, you can get several females entering a cell. So you can imagine how much hemolymph the poor larva loses. Um, the transfer from one colony to another is from drifting, from robbing. Um, you also can get the scenario where there's colony collapse and you will get in desperation, the bees will just evacuate and disappear to other colonies that will accept them. Um, and of course, they take a load of a row with them. It is a horrendous thing. And unfortunately, we have to live with it. So, there are approved medications to deal with it. And this is where the fun starts. And I'm going to use the word allegedly quite a lot from here on in. Um, we need as beekeepers to keep um, a record of medications that we apply to our colonies. But the problem with our medications is that for some reason, bees were included underneath um, a set of legislation, the veterinary medicines legislation. And in order to get your chemical approved to be on that list, you have got a considerable number of tests and hoops and so on and so forth that have to be gone through. If you're developing a medicine for, let's say, uh, milking cows or for uh, the pig herd, I can fully understand it. I'm not so sure that it was the right road for beekeeping, but it's the road we are on and we have to accept it. Now, it's a massively contentious situation as there are a few approved treatments which basically rely on oxalic acid and or other chemicals. They are pricey. And apart from everyone claiming to use them for legal reasons, the product sales nowhere matches the colony numbers in the UK. So you can draw a conclusion from that. 
There are chemically impregnated strips that are used, but they bring their own issues. Now, these strips are put in the brood box um, in the autumn. Uh, the bees walk across them. The chemical goes into the bee and then it's transferred through the rest of the colony. But they bring their own issues. Left for too long due to ignorance or illness or even the death of the beekeeper, um, the dosage, obviously, as time goes on, diminishes and the varroa become resistant. And the, one of the first strips that was used had a chemical fluvalinate and the bit varroa became resistant to it within the space of, I think it was less than five years. It was, it was shocking how fast they, they adapted. So <clears throat> many allegedly use oxalic acid trickle in the winter broodless period, if such a thing actually exists in our modern soft winters, and others allegedly use oxalic acid vapor. I say allegedly, as I personally have never seen anyone do this, I've just read about it. B-Base has a calculator facility into which you input a number of mites per day or week and the answer whether to treat immediately or not pops up. Now, the number of mites per day or week says you, well, what's that? This is the natural death rate. And the way that you discover this is you put a sheet of paper with a coating of something sticky on it, Vaseline, cooking oil. Um, you slide that sheet in and actually a day isn't long enough. Um, really, it should be a week. And then you will get a number of varroa mites that will fall off the bees. Uh, they're either dying naturally or it's just might drop. Um, and they stick to your paper. After the due time, you take the paper out and then you can do a count and see how many varroa you've got. From that, you can divide by seven and obviously you've got the daily might drop. And that's the number you put into B base. And this is the point at which the rationale for having an open mesh floor becomes a bit more evident because apart from ventilation, any mites dropping off the bees with a bit of luck don't bounce on the mesh. They slide through the holes onto the ground and are lost to the colony. Bonus. The less varroa you've got, the better. Um, is there any hope with Varroa? Yes. Uh, people are working hard to breed colonies that can cope with Varroa by means of grooming, which is how uh, Avis Serrana deals with it. And the answer may well lie in other research, well, that's my own typo, sorry, in other research that is ongoing, bacterial interference may be the way forward, time will tell. There is some very interesting research being done in the universities in Scotland. Uh, there's a gentleman in Aberdeen who was being talked about a couple of years ago. Things seem to have gone a bit quiet there, but you know, never say never. With a bit of luck, something will come to light because Varroa is a problem in every country in the world apart from Australia. So there are a lot of very, very bright brains um, in action and more power to their brain cells is all I can say. Right, moving on, pests. Well, the biggest pest to a hive Looking in the mirror, it's us. You know, there's more queens lost by clumsy beekeepers than probably any other factor. So we need to be careful. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, theft of beehives is not uncommon. I've lost a nucleus myself many, many years ago when I rather stupidly had bees quite close to a, a relatively busy road. Somebody spotted and uh, helped themselves one night. So if you're working an out apiary, you want to have it reasonably 
uh, inconspicuous, shall we say. Mice, nasty little so-and-sos. Eight millimeter is your friend. Why? Because a mouse cannot get through an eight millimeter hole or slot, right? Mice have the ability to be able to flatten the rib cage where the skull can get through, they can get the body to follow through a slot, not a hole. And eight millimeter, if you're wondering what sort of dimension that is in real life. What have I been earlier? About that. Ballpoint pen, end of approximately eight mil. So, uh, just through my window, about 500, 600 yards from where I'm sitting, there is quite a substantial badger set. Uh, there's about eight active halls. Winter time is very useful for being able to work out what's alive and what's not when it comes to badger. Excuse me. And uh, I was warned when I first moved here that uh, I was liable to have problems with badgers, but no, nothing at all. And where my bees are, um, at the top of the field, there is a track, the other side of that track, when I say track, I mean, you know, uh, agricultural access track. The other side of there, they are moving out to the gorse because it's invading the field. Um, gorse, by the way, grows out and roots and grows out and roots, and you'd be astonished at how fast it actually moves. I had an apiary for five years once, and half the apiary disappeared in the space of that five years. Really. So they are moving that gorse, and there's obviously badgers up there because I've seen the badger latrines. So quite distinctive once you know what you're looking at. Um, and you definitely don't want your dog rolling in that, trust me. So I haven't had a problem with badgers, but it's not unheard of. Woodpeckers, they can get quite um, addicted to bees. And one of the answers to that is chicken wire uh, stretched over the hives with a, a suitable gap so the, the beaks can't actually get at the hives. Wasps, well, there are duties kind of out in this one. There's people who say um, they're brilliant for the, the um, dealing with the aphids and what have you. And, and yes, they are. I'm not going to argue with that. But they are also little so-and-sos for robbing out colonies that are a little on the weak side. And the wasp people will say, well, yeah, it's meant to your problem. You shouldn't have weak colonies. Well, yes, in a perfect world, nobody's got a weak anything, but it happens. And wasps will actually rob out and effectively kill um, a, weak, a weak colony. It's because there's a time in the wasp's life cycle where it trips from wanting protein to wanting carbs, and that's when they become a, a, a damn pest. You can put wasp traps out. Um, I'll leave that up to yourselves. Hornets, um, so far the hornet invasions or infestations that we've had in the UK have been spotted and have been dealt with. They are European hornets and they are a pest to bees because they hawk them. They actually, if you think about a kestrel uh, going for a mouse and you know swooping down and grabbing it, that's what they do with bees. But obviously, there's a hell of a lot more bees for them to get than there are mice for a kestrel. 
So hornets can be a serious pest, but so far so good, we don't actually have them yet. And that's pests and diseases an overview. Uh, I hope you haven't found this too depressing because personally I find it the most depressing part of, um, of a beginner's course, but you have to know this. You have to know what the, the legislation is. You have to know that we have Varroa. You have to know that it's possible to live with it. Um, if you broaden your uh, online experience, there is a very good forum called the beekeepingforum.co.uk. You might find some more information on there, especially about Varroa, because it is a topic of unceasing discussion. Right, I'm going to leave it there and get this uploaded and get the email out with the links for the videos. And I will hopefully see you on uh, Sunday when we'll have something slightly, hopefully, uh, more enjoyable. Thanks for your attention.